What statisticians get wrong? Uh, maybe that's kind of a click baity title because that sounds like this is a criticism and it's not, but it kind of is. And I really hope I don't make enemies of my friends. I love you fellow statisticians. And by the way, the things that I'm about to say are um, from my perspective as a quantitative psychologist, but I'm assuming that everything that I'm about to say applies to other disciplines as well. But first, let me talk about what is a quantitative psychologist. So the way that I introduce it to people is that I am 90% statistician, 10% psychologist. Or another way to think about it is I'm a specialized statistician. So quantitative psychologists, not me specifically, but quantitative psychologists tend to specialize in measurement. Because the thing is, like, if you're trying to measure depression or anxiety, it's not as easy as measuring the speed of a falling object or the weight of something. We have to deal with latent variables or variables that can't be observed, like depression or anxiety. And when you can't directly observe anxiety or depression, how do you measure it? Yeah, that's a tough question. And what we do is we try to measure manifestations of anxiety or depression. So you might give somebody a questionnaire and ask them how depressed they feel, for example. And anytime you're doing this, there's going to be measurement error. How do you deal with that measurement error? That's really what quantitative psychologists forte are. In fact, factor analysis, which is one of the primary methods we use to evaluate measurement models, was invented by quantitative psychologists. So I would say the majority of quantitative psychologists either do what I do, which is just end up in academia, or actually a probably larger portion of them end up working for testing companies like the people who develop the SAT or the GRE or the ACT or the MCAT or whatever. Because that sort of measurement is really our forte. And quantitative psychologists like me are the sort of people that try to make sure that when you're measuring people's SAT score, it's actually a valid measure of college readiness. But again, that's not me. I am, uh, so uh, I did my PhD in missing data and since then I've migrated to do more visualization and statistics pedagogy. So yeah, that's what quantitative psychologists do. Uh, now let me read kind of a brief uh, history. This comes from an article by Aiken, West, Seacrest, and Reno that talks about kind of the integration of quantitative psychology with applied psychologists. And they said, during the 1960s, psychologists liked to fancy themselves as the leaders among the social sciences and statistical measurement and design issues. Although some of the self-perception undoubtedly stemmed from disciplinary chauvinism, it may have been in part true. Psychologists were then the only social scientists to use factorial experimental designs in the laboratory. So basically it's saying in the 1960s, psychologists prided themselves on being statistically savvy. And I continue. The past 20 years have witnessed important developments in statistics, methodology, and measurement. Or in other words, the field of quantitative psychology has become much more advanced. And continuing, substantive developments have also changed the nature of the questions psychologists ask and the settings in which they perform their research. These developments have led to the posing of broader and more complex questions often addressed with research carried out in non-laboratory contexts, in which traditional designs and analyses provided at best non-optimal and at worst wrong answers. So basically what this is saying is that in the 1960s, all the psychologists were experimentalists. And so they knew how to do ANOVAs and factorial ANOVAs, and they were pretty good at it. But then as psychology started to broaden, their needs started to broaden as well. And they stopped doing experimental sort of methods and instead did more longitudinal stuff or more correlational research and that sort of thing. And so basically it's saying that two things happened, that within quantitative psychology, the methods became much more sophisticated and also the psychologists taking these methods classes, their needs became much broader. So in the 1960s, statisticians or quantitative psychologists and psychologists really worked hand in hand. So the methods developed by my kind of people were used regularly in applied research, or even the psychologists themselves regularly contributed to statistical methods. But that's totally not the case anymore. And just to give you an idea of where quantitative psychology is at, I'm just gonna read some titles from the most recent issue of Multivariate Behavioral Research, one of the best journals in my field. Testing Conditional Independence in Psychometric Networks, an analysis of three Bayesian methods. Multi-level latent differential structural equation model with short time series and time varying covariates, a comparison of frequentist and Bayesian estimators. Beyond Pearson's correlation, modern non-parametric independence tests for psychological research. Linear mixed effect models for dependent data, power and accuracy in parameter estimation. Parametric G formula for testing time varying causal effects, what it is, why it matters, and how to implement it in Levon. 
Path and Directional Discovery in Individual Dynamic Factor Models, a regularized, hybrid, unified structural equation modeling with latent variables. An exact Bayesian model for meta-analysis of the standardized mean differences with its simultaneous credible intervals. Multi-level, semi-parametric, latent variable modeling in R with Gallum. That sounds like Gollum. Gollum. My precious. My so did any of you understand the titles of those articles? Um, probably not. Um, I didn't understand several of them. So the amount of sophistication has increased in quantitative psychology, whereas the methodological sophistication of psychologists, if anything, has regressed. Or to say it differently, statistics and methodology has really outpaced the capabilities, and I would say the needs, of applied researchers. So why did we do this? Why did these statisticians decide to abandon ANOVAs and t-tests and regression model research? Why are they doing these complex models? Well, honestly, doing research in t-tests and ANOVA is boring. And you could even argue there's not much left to research. We've kind of moved on from that. And it's really not novel anymore. And I actually had a recent experience where I submitted a paper about um, different unique ways of visualizing uh, regression models and they rejected it. And I submitted it to the one of the top journals in my field and they basically said, we have moved on from this. This is too basic. That's kind of indicative of what's happening. And I would say they're probably very tired, like I am, of trying to make changes among people who don't want to change. And so if they're going to get pushback, which I get tons of pushback because of their research in stuff that's more on the ground, why would they want to do that when that stuff's kind of boring to them anyway? So they move on from those things. And I think another reason why we don't make much headway as statisticians is that there's not good consensus on what the solution to the replication crisis is. There are proponents who think that the way out is through estimation and confidence intervals. So that would be like... Uh, coming in his new statistics, for example. Other people think the solution is Bayesian statistics, like Krushki and Wagenmachers, and maybe Andrew Gelman too. And then other people, like myself and Joe Rogers, think the way forward is through modeling. That instead of teaching people to do t tests in ANOVA, we instead teach modeling. And by the way, that approach is the answer. Because modeling subsumes. Bayesian and confidence intervals and effect sizes. So that's the way to do it. I only partially say that cheekily. I actually do believe that's the solution. Um, but I also recognize that I'm biased. But there are costs to moving on from these basic methods. I think one of the biggest costs is that whatever methods they developed are never going to be used, at least in applied settings. Or if they are, it's going to take decades. Because the vast majority of researchers use t-tests and ANOVAs at least in this article from 2017. That's what they argue. And I don't think there's any reason to suspect that in seven years, people have become suddenly way more sophisticated. So while applied researchers are using t-tests and ANOVAs, and quantitative psychologists are investigating sophisticated models like growth curve models or Bayesian methods or latent variable models, we've got a disconnect that leads to this sort of communication problem. So you might be saying, okay, what's the big deal? Hey, if they're happy, I'm happy, we're all happy, who cares? What's the problem? Well, the problem is that there's a lack of communication between the stats experts and the applied people. I mean, just look at the replication crisis. I think the replication crisis is the best evidence we have that there is a communication problem. And actually, I've seen kind of two different responses from statisticians about the replication crisis. I'd say the majority of statisticians say, of course there's a replication crisis. We've been telling you for 50 years there's a replication crisis. And they will say, we've always known about these issues that now you lay people are discovering. But we've been warning you for decades not to do these things. And there's some truth to that. And I'm going to go ahead and link an article in the description that talks about all these issues that we've been talking about for a long time. And so the statistician's response is kind of like, yeah, you're just now catching up to what we've known for a long time. I told you so. And there's one prominent quantitative psychologist um, that uh, I heard the story from somebody else, but um, they were telling their mentor, who's again, very reputable quantitative psychologist. Um, this was just when the replication crisis was happening. And he said to his mentor, like, hey, we should get in on this bandwagon. Like we need to do something. 
And very overtly, this quantitative psychologist looked at him and went, oh, I don't care. It doesn't affect me. It doesn't interest me. And I'd say that for the majority of quantitative psychologists, that's kind of the reaction. They don't care. Although I would push back against that response, at least a little bit. While it is true that we knew about these problems for a long time, I don't think we realize the implication of a lot of these problems. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and read a quote from Andrew Gelman's blog. And for those of you who don't know, Andrew Gelman is a world-renowned statistician. Um, probably, like, if there's a fame index, he's really high. <laughs> Um, if you can be famous for statistics, um, guy knows what he's doing. And what he said, uh, talking about Daryl Bem's article where, if you want to learn more about that, I'll leave a link in the description. But he said, after Bem's article, certain earlier work was seen to fit into this larger pattern that certain methodological flaws in standard statistical practice were not merely isolated mistakes or even patterns of mistakes, but that they could be doing serious damage to the scientific process. Some relevant documents here are John Iannotis's 2005 paper, Why Most Published Research Findings Are False, and Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler's paper from 2007 claiming that obesity is contagious. Iannotis's paper is now a classic, but when it came out, I don't think most of us thought through its larger implications. Let me say that again. Andrew Gelman, one of the most reputable statisticians, said, I don't think most of us thought through its larger implications. And he goes on to say, my point is these events from 2005 and 2007 fit into our storyline, but were not fully recognized as such at the time. It was Bem, perhaps, who kicked us all into the realization that bad work could be the rule, not the exception. So as of early 2011, there's a sense that something's wrong, but it's not so clear to people how wrong things are. And observers, myself included, by the way, that emphasis is mine. Remain unaware of the ubiquity, indeed the obviousness, of fatal multiple comparison problems in so much published research. Or I should say the deadly combination of weak theory being supported almost entirely by statistically significant results, which themselves are the product of uncontrolled researcher degrees of freedom. So even though uh, quantitative psychologists are prone to say, yeah, we knew this all along, um, I don't think that most of us understood the larger implications. Because I was in graduate school prior to the replication crisis. And as my professors were teaching these things, teaching null hypothesis significance testing, for example, they didn't have nearly the warnings that they should about how dangerous this could be. But whether we recognized it was a problem before it became a problem or afterward, uh, you might be asking, like I'm asking, shouldn't we be doing something about this? Shouldn't quantitative psychologists be at the forefront of making changes in the way we do research? But they're not. I mean, if you read those article titles, they're not talking about the replication crisis. They're talking about methods that not many people actually use. And I had this conversation once with E.J. Wagenmakers, uh, who's a Dutch researcher who specializes in Bayesian methods. And he's one of the leading figures in the open science movement and post-replication crisis methodology. And actually one of his papers I believe, coined the term replication crisis. And I talked about the fact that quantitative psychologists are researching these really complex things. And the way that he put it is he said, yeah, he said it is like they are rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. And I couldn't agree more. Like who cares about the advanced, these advanced sophisticated methods if people are really screwing up t-tests and ANOVAs. So in addition to that, I think um, there's a blind spot that my kind have, that they don't know that people don't know these things. They just assume that what they consider as obvious, everybody considers obvious. And that is not the case. And I've got several examples because my research is in that area. And my biggest problem when I'm trying to publish is that I write statistically focused articles to a lay audience. And so when I submit a paper for review, what tends to happen is the journal has statisticians review it. And many, many times for some of my biggest articles, including two that I will link in the description, the paper was either rejected or criticized by methodologists who were saying, this is obvious. Everybody knows this. You're not contributing anything new to the literature. And because I am more on the ground, I would say, with these applied research, I would say, oh no, they do not know this. I guarantee you, they do not know this. And so we started specifically asking for non-statisticians to review this. And sure enough, 
Non-statisticians were saying, this is brilliant. I had no idea this was there, which was helpful because the editor could say, oh, this isn't well known. So in short, there's like this huge communication problem between quantitative psychologists and applied psychologists. And how do we overcome that? I don't know that I have all the answers, but I'm just going to give a couple of suggestions. Um, but I think it all starts in the classroom. And what I think the best thing that you can do if you are a stats teacher is to integrate your teaching with their research. I think the way that it starts is that you stop lecturing and start communicating. I took a lot of stats classes as a graduate student and I've been to a lot of seminars where the professors are lecturing. Where they're not checking in with the students and making sure that the students are understanding things. They're just talking and talking and talking. And that's not the way to teach. That discourages critical thinking and it encourages students to learn just enough to pass the class without actually integrating what they learn in their stats classes into their own research. Another thing I think we need to do is to bridge the gap between what applied researchers are doing and what we're trying to teach our students. And this is like one of my biggest struggles is that I will teach my students using my terminology and then in their labs, their professors are using a totally different terminology without realizing that they're talking about the same thing. I think a good example, I teach my students to do model comparisons, specifically nested model comparisons. And then they write that in their paper and their mentor has no idea what they're talking about. They're like, no, you shouldn't do whatever this nested model comparison is. You should do a hierarchical model. Guess what a hierarchical model is? It's a nested model comparison. So if you're using a hierarchical model in SPSS, not a hierarchical linear model, that's a different thing, but a hierarchical model, if you're using that in SPSS, you're doing a nested model comparison. And so I spend a lot of my time translating. All right, when your professor says this and I say this, we're actually talking about the same thing. So I think that's helpful to try to bridge the gap and make sure that you two, that your students and their mentors are communicating about statistics in a similar way. And then I think the best thing you could do, which I have been doing since I started at my current university, is have them bring their research into your classroom. Integrate their research assignments with your classroom assignments. Because too often, what students do is they will learn what they need to learn to pass the test and then do the research where, whatever way their mentor is saying. And that's not the way to bring about change. So instead, you have them bring their research into your classroom, and then you become aware of the different terminologies that they use, and then you can help the students make the translation. And then you can be there and play kind of a consultant role and help bridge the gap of communication between them. And I'm sure there are other ideas. I just don't know what they are. But uh, it's clear that that's something that we do need to do to improve the communication between the stats researchers and the people who actually use stats. Because if we don't do something, it's just going to get worse. Anyway, that's all I got to say about that. And if you want additional resources to help you become a better teacher, then I invite you to visit simplistics.net where you can take my course. And I actually get a lot of people asking me like, hey, um, I've been doing stats for years. Would, my, would your course be helpful? And I say yes, because if you're taught the traditional way, this will give you a totally new perspective on statistics and help you think a different way about statistics. And if you take my simplistics class, you can see how I structure statistics from the foundation up, starting from modeling. And I think that more than anything is going to fix the replication crisis. And by the way, uh, in a little over a week, I start the November class, the November live class. So if you want to have interaction with me live, ask your questions of me directly through Zoom, then we still have a few slots open. And that starts, and that's happening every Monday afternoon, Eastern Standard Time for the month of November. If you do visit Simplistics, you're supporting me and helping me continue to make content for you, which I want to keep doing. So I hope to see you in a Simplistics class. And with that, that's all I got to say. Peace out.